I trust we all had a, a wonderful week. And that throughout this week, we were able to witness, to experience the saving power of Jesus Christ and his sustaining grace. Uh, this morning, I want to give us an encouragement. I heard Brother Robert encouraging us to look at the great controversy to assist in handing out this particular book. And uh, I want to tell you, it's, it's really a gem of a book for everybody to have. And I'm going to encourage us to participate in that if we have not read it yet, as he said, to dig deep and to search. Uh, I got that first book, that book when I was a teenager. And uh, from I got it, I finished it in about uh, five days. I couldn't put it down. It was that engrossing. And I believe the messages there are relevant for our time. So I'm going to encourage us to take hold of that particular challenge. It is my privilege today to address you, and it's always an awesome task to stand before the people of God. But as I stand, I'm going to ask that you pray for me, that the message that God has laid on my heart will indeed be received by his people. Uh, but just before I start, I'm going to ask us to just bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, I stand before thee, Lord, in this vessel of clay. I'm not worthy, but thou hast called. And when you have called, Lord, it is our responsibility to respond to you. I pray that you will pour your spirit out even now upon your people. I pray, Father, that you will consecrate my thoughts, my words, my mind, my deliberations. And that the message that you have for your people will come forward with clarity and that they will understand that your Holy Spirit will be poured out and will minister the words to each and every heart so that we may receive, and in receiving, uh, we may be transformed as we apply it to our hearts and as we live it daily. I thank you even now, in the name of Jesus, amen. I invite us to open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. In the book of Revelation, chapter 14, it opens with a vision of the Lamb, the Lamb of God standing on Mount Zion. And with him the 144,000, having the character of Jesus, the Father's name written in their foreheads. We are told in verse 4 that these are the redeemed of the earth. We are given a number of characteristics about these saints. Number one, they have the character of Jesus because they have his name. They are overcomers. They have overcome. They are the first fruits. If first fruits, there are others to follow. That no guile was found in their mouth. They were blameless. They stood before the throne of God without fault. They stood before the throne of God without fault. Uh, thereafter comes the messages of the three angels. Return to the worship of the Creator. The announcement of the fall of Babylon and the stern warning of God not to worship the beast, his image, or to receive his mark in the forehead or in their hand. It is within this context that verse 12 is given. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and keep the faith of Jesus. In other words, to stand without fault before the throne of God, the saints of God must have perfected love in their hearts and fully possess the faith of Jesus. The commandments is love. That's what it is. To stand in the presence of an awesome God who is a consuming fire holy and righteous, to stand before the throne of his presence from which proceedeth 
lightning and thunderings and to be accepted in the beloved without guile and without fault is the Lord's desire for us all. Every single one of us. God wants us to see stand before him. But we must keep the commandments of God. And we must have the faith of Jesus. Uh, this morning I want to explore, to examine the faith of Jesus. And I want to do the following. I want to look at the foundation of our faith. Where does this faith come from? How do we develop or mature this faith? And finally, what kind of faith is needed to stand in these times? What is the foundation of our faith? Before we look at where our faith comes from or what the foundation is, I want to look at what is faith. And when we look, open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1, what does, it, what does it tell us? Hebrews chapter 11, sorry, verse 1. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What is God telling us here? That for us to have faith, we must look beyond that which is visible, that which is our present reality. We must look beyond all of that. And we must grasp hold of the promises that God has in store for us. For the Bible tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Our faith has a basis. Our faith has a foundation. And everyone exercises faith or belief in something right or wrong, whether it's misplaced or it's appropriately placed. If I'm asked to put my trust and my faith in someone, I would have a few questions. Who are they? Where are they from? And obviously they expect some form of action or commitment on my part, so what is it that they want and why? Yet many of us blindly put our trust in others and wonder why we are so often disappointed. It may be politicians, it may be friends. While others will disappoint, God will never disappoint. God does not simply invite us to put our trust in him, but he gives us ample demonstration of who he is, what he's about, and why he is interested in you and me. If you look at Jeremiah 31, verse 3. Turn your Bibles there. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. God is giving us an idea of why he is interested in us. The prophet Jeremiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, The Lord has appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, and therefore with love and kindness have I drawn thee. God is saying he has a love for us, a deep-rooted love. And he's pictured as wooing us. He's pictured as inviting us to come to his side, into a covenant relationship with him. When I look back at the first beginnings and we go back to the Garden of Eden... It's an interesting picture, because here in the Garden of Eden, God created a perfect atmosphere, a perfect home for our first parents, Adam and Eve. It was beautiful. It was lovely. It was splendid, far beyond the imagination can, can hold on to. And God lovingly formed man, Adam. He formed Eve. He instructed them. He nourished them. He gave them everything that they could ever want in this life. They were happy. They were comfortable. But then came the tempter. The first test of faith, the first test of loyalty. And consider this. As Satan 
came in the form of a snake to Adam and to Eve. As he began to sow seeds of discontent, the question to be asked is, who are you? Where are you from? I've never seen you before. What have you done for me? I know what God has done, but what have you done for me? I have no experience with you. I do not know you, but nevertheless, they turned their back on God, who had done everything for them, denied him, and they obeyed the devil. They rejected God, and they believed a lie. But the one who gave them life, love, and fellowship, and who personally nurtured them, they rejected. That is the history of mankind. The law that was broken in the garden was God's law. The fellowship that was severed was fellowship with God. And so the penalty was us to bear. The penalty of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. But God will not let us go whom he loved, not willing that any should perish or be lost, but that all should have life. He sent his son to be humiliated and to die on the cross for you and I. That is love. He took the death that we should have experienced, that we might have the life that was his. He became our substitute in our place. Romans 5 verse 7 tells us, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet by adventure for a good man some may even die. But we were not good. When Christ came, we were wicked, we were evil, but God commendeth his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Verse 10 says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God took our place on the cross. He took our punishment. His gift to us was Christ Jesus. Song of Solomon 2, verse 4, expresses from another angle the love of God for us. He says that he brought me to his banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. He brought me to his banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Even when we were rejectors of his love, his banner over me is love. Do you want to reject a God like that? The character of God is spelt out in the Ten Commandments, summarized as love towards God and love towards man. God has given us ample evidence of who he is and what he is about. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and will by no means clear the guilty. Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. Hebrews 13 verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. From Revelation, from Genesis to Revelation, God reveals who he is and demonstrates his faithfulness, his mercy, his graciousness, his long-suffering, his abundance of goodness and truth, his forgiveness, his love, but also his judgment. Can we trust him? Can we trust him? Uh, we know, therefore, in whom we have believed, and we know why he ha we have believed, and where faith is required, we know our faith will not be disappointed. For faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. Why have we believed? His banner over me is love. The foundation of our faith is Jesus Christ. 
What he has done for us demonstrated on the cross of Calvary. Everything centers in Jesus Christ. There's an interesting passage in Philippians 3 verse 10 that Paul mentions. And he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. We're talking about knowing in whom we trust. We're talking about knowing in whom we have placed our faith in. We're talking about the foundation of our faith. And when you look on the word that I may know, know him, Paul is saying that I, I want to be acquainted with Jesus Christ. I want to be, I want to know him inside out. And it's the same word that is used in the Old Testament. It says Adam knew Eve. A level of intimacy that begins and continues. Paul says I want to be inside out in terms of knowledge of Jesus Christ. And friends, I'm going to tell you, from now on till eternity, we'll still be knowing Jesus Christ. But also he wants to know the power of his resurrection. Paul wants to experience. He wants to have the spirit that was resident in Christ Jesus that raised him up from the dead. So that we can dwell in the newness of life and that we can conform to the image of God. Paul says that I may know him. That should be our desire today. That we may know Jesus Christ. Now I want to take us to the point of where does our faith come from? Because we assume that the faith that we have is the faith that we ought to have. But we know that faith is needed because without faith we can't please God. In Romans chapter 12 verse 3, Paul tells us, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. God is so good. We need the faith to please him. We need the faith to appropriate his righteousness through grace unto our lives. But even that faith, Jesus has given unto us. He has gifted unto every man a measure of faith. It is a little easier to exercise faith when you know whom the foundation of your faith is and in whom you're exercising faith in. But how is this faith aroused? So every man has this faith. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you are an atheist or a believer or a non-believer, every man has a measure of faith. But how do we arouse that faith in each of us? In Romans 10, verse 13, Romans 10, verse 13, it gives us some clues as to how we arouse this faith in us. And it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. And bring glad tidings of good things. Verse 17. So then, faith cometh by hearing and by hearing the word of God. That's how you arouse this faith within mankind. But I want to ask us a question. Have we been sharing the faith that we have? Have we been arousing the faith in others who need to hear this message so that faith can become alive? And so with that faith, they can take hold onto Jesus Christ. Have we been diligent in doing that? There are people that God has put in our lives. Perhaps no other person has a better opportunity of sharing that faith, sharing the word of God with them but us. 
have we been diligent? It could be someone who is a co-worker. It could be your neighbor. It could be someone you meet in the gym. It could be someone simply in the supermarkets. Faith cometh by hearing the word of God. But if the word is not preached, if the word is not shared, how can that faith be aroused in many who are dying, wanting, pleading for someone to share that faith with them? It so happens that my father is in the hospital right now, not very conscious. But when my mom goes home and she parks the car in front of the house, uh, the neighbors who were there who understood that there's something that happened, uh, they'll come across and they say, what happened to your husband? Uh, he normally, as he walks in the neighborhood, takes his walk, will talk to us. And she didn't know what he was doing when he walked and when he talked. But they said he was sharing the gospel of the kingdom of God in his own way but she had absolutely no idea. What are we doing with the word that God has given us? The three angels in Revelation 14, given the message, messages to the world, are none other than God's people. Are you listening to me? None other than God's people. The commission given to us in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, to go, to teach, to baptize, and to make disciples makes it clear that the messengers, which is what angels are, the messengers are the saints. What are we doing with the message that God has given unto us? The world is waiting for the preaching of the message of the word of God. In John 4, 35, Jesus says to his disciples as he was uh, having a discourse with them, he says, Say not that there are four months, and yet, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are white already to harvest. The people are waiting. All they need now is to hear the word of God being spoken to them by his people. But to deliver these message, messages with clarity, with power, and with conviction, so that this faith that God has gifted men may be aroused demands a number of things. One, we must know the truth for ourselves. Goes without saying, how can you share that which you do not know, that which you have no experience with? We must be able to defend the truth. Secondly, we must be consecrated by the truth we hold, uh, meaning that we must live out the messages in our lives. Uh, then people will see the power of our messages. And thirdly, we must be bold, yet humble, in the proclamation of this truth. In this third point, I want us to consider the testimony of Peter and John. Uh, they had been in the temple by the gate beautiful, they had seen a man, and they had healed him in the name of Jesus. And they were preaching, and they were teaching in the name of Jesus Christ. Go with me to Acts chapter 4. And they returned from verse 23. They returned to the brethren after all of this experience. That is, the Jewish Sanhedrin had brought them up, had arrested them, and had said, come, let us investigate and interrogate in whose name you have done all of these things. And after they had interrogated them, they found out they couldn't do much more. They threatened them. In verse 23, in verse 18, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. Uh, Peter and John responded to them. But in verse 23, it says, And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had done. Uh, they reported. And here's what they did. They 
verse 29, and says, And now, Lord, they are praying. Behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. And in verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they speak the word of God with what? With boldness. The shaking of the area where they were praying signified that God had heard and had respect to their prayers. They didn't ask, they said, Lord, shield me from this. They said, Lord, grant unto thy servant boldness that we may go forth and share the word. Friends, I think in this time and age, we need the boldness of the apostles to speak the word without favor, to speak the word without fear. Because God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But the things God has promised, we must ask for it. If you don't ask, how shall you receive? You want boldness? You want the power of the Holy Spirit? Ask him for it. You want the Holy Spirit? Ask God for his Holy Spirit. And when we have his Holy Spirit, we'll do exploits for him if we are submitted completely to him. The other question is, how do we receive the Holy Spirit in our lives? In John chapter 3, there's a man who was highly ranked in the Jewish society, and his name was called Nicodemus. He came on to Jesus. He had some things on his mind. And he opened his mouth, and Jesus perceived exactly what he needed. And in verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And in verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Our minds must be renewed. We must be changed. We must have a new heart. But how do we get this? Jesus says we must be born again. The Spirit of God will come into us. Born of water, born of the Spirit. Water symbolizing baptism. That's when we come into repentance and we say, Lord, you know, I have been walking contrary to all thy ways. I repent. Father, forgive me. And we make a public display of that. God gives to us his Holy Spirit, which is able to transform us, change us, and help us to become like Jesus Christ. And in verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Let's go back to verse 14. Verse 14 says, as, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. And John 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And verse 13 says, Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. When we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, he gives to us his Holy Spirit. But we are told in Romans 8, verse 9, Now if any man, let us start from the beginning, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, and if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you, now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. God says you must have his Spirit to be one of his. And verse 10 says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. 
Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So God has gifted to us, let us start from the beginning. So to have faith in God, we must know this God. And having known him, we must receive his Holy Spirit. Having received his Holy Spirit, we must be led by his Holy Spirit. We must walk in obedience to his Spirit. The next question I want to ask us is, how do we mature this faith? So if we have the Holy Spirit residing in us and are indeed walking in obedience to the Spirit, God gives us with something else. He gives us something else. Notice in the plan of salvation, God is constantly giving. He gives us his son. Through the cross, he gives us his son that he may be our, our substitute. He gives every man a measure of faith. He gives us the Holy Spirit. But Galatians 2 verse 20 tells us something else that God is giving us. Just turn with me to Galatians 2 verse 20. If you were here last week, Pastor, share this, this passage also with you. But I want to highlight something from this, from this passage here. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. To be crucified with Christ, Paul is saying that I have joined with Christ in oneness in baptism. As Jesus was crucified on the cross, so has the old man been crucified and buried. And as Jesus has been risen from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, so then are we risen to live in the newness of life a changed heart, a changed attitude, a renewed mind made possible by the Holy Spirit. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. But he says, nevertheless, I live. Spiritually, he's now alive. He has passed from death into life. Anyone who has not the Spirit of God is under condemnation because all have sinned. The death penalty has been pronounced. Jesus has a rescue plan. If you are not in Jesus, you're still under condemnation. But Paul says, I have been crucified. And nevertheless, not I live yet, not I, but Christ liveth in me, the gift of God's Holy Spirit. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? You have the power of God resident, residing in you. What does he do? And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is saying that Christ, through the medium of his Holy Spirit, is living out his life in you and me. Have you ever considered the walk of Enoch with God? The walk of Abraham and the faith that he possessed. Uh, the walk of Elijah and the exploits that he did. Daniel and the three Hebrew worthies. And even Paul himself. It's the power of Christ living in us. If we'll only surrender. If we'll only allow God to do in us what he desires to do. Form an image of his son The old man is buried with all his sinful tendencies, his inclination and his ways has been crucified. The things that we do, we no longer have a desire to do because God's spirit is within us. And the things that we want to do are the things that pleases God. Christ is living in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Interesting statement. I live by the faith of the Son of God. God. Whose faith do we have? We have the faith of the Son of God, the faith of Jesus Christ. So here is the Holy Spirit coming to reside in us. He's gifting us many different things and making a lot of stuff possible in Jesus Christ. But the same Spirit that was resident in Jesus 
is the same spirit that has been gifted to us. The same spirit that enabled Jesus to have the faith that he had is the same spirit that is imparting that faith to us. If we'll only let go of the controls, Jesus says that all things are possible if we only believe. The problem is sometimes that we limit God, we restrict God by our limited thinking. We limit God by processing things and in, in terms of the five senses that we have. If we can't see it, feel it, smell it, touch it, hear it, it doesn't exist. It's not possible. But faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith reaches beyond that which we can see, hear, touch, and feel, and hold onto the promises of Jesus Christ. That makes it possible. Christ living in me, the hope of glory. If we have the mind of Christ, and the Holy Spirit is renewing our minds, shall not the same Spirit also impart to us the faith of Christ. He says, a life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Romans 8.32 tells us that he spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him, Christ Jesus, also freely give us all things? Friends, we do not know the power of that we have residing in us. We do not know the faith that God has gifted to us to exercise. It's an enduring faith. It's a deep faith. But I'm going to tell you this, that the faith that we have must, and it will be tested, to see what sort of faith it is that we have. Do not shrink from the testing of your faith. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, tells us this. Just turn there for me. Romans 5, verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God because we have been reconciled by whom we have access by faith into this grace. Grace means that the relationship that we now enjoy with God, we do not deserve. It is God's favor. Wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory, in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, not only so, but we glory in tribulations, trials, adverse circumstances that will come our way to try and test us. Knowing that tribulation does what? It worketh patience. Revelation 14. Here are the patience of the saints. And patience worketh what? Experience. We must have an experience with Jesus Christ. An abiding experience with him. And what does experience work? An experience worketh hope. We're talking about faith. So, trials, patience, patience, experience, experience, hope. What happens when your faith is tried and tested? It becomes stronger. It becomes more grounded. It becomes more rooted. And Christ wants us to have a faith that is well-grounded, that is rooted, and he has to be the root and the ground of that faith. What kind of faith is needed in these times? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. In the previous chapter, uh, they have gone through the heroes of the faith. And in chapter 12, it starts, wherefore, seeing we are encompassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, those who have gone before, 
And if you read the great controversy and you reach to part of the Reformation, you read the areas where people were punished, persecuted, put to death for their faith, then you begin to understand the trial that our faith has gone through. But then the writer says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. But here's what we are to do. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus. Looking where? Looking unto Jesus. He is the author He is the finisher of our faith. What does that mean? Where does the faith that we have comes from? It comes from Jesus. Who perfects his faith? Who matures his faith in us? It is Jesus who does that. He matures it and he perfects this faith in us. And he says that, For who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What did Jesus do as he embraced the cross? Think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Think about the the powers of darkness as they encompassed him, as they pressed in against them, pressed in against him. Jesus was dealing with this, but he had the strength to do it because at the end of it, he saw you and me. Think of the beating that he got, the scourging. He had the strength to do it because at the end of it, he saw you and me. Think of the cross as he was being nailed to it. The Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him. What was the joy at the end of it all? Jesus saw you and I on the sea of glass, standing before his throne, blameless, thoughtless, perfected in the character of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That was his joy. He saw beyond what the eyes and the senses was showing him, and he saw the result of it. The enemy will seek to steal the rays of light that shine upon us from the throne of God and separate us from our maker. He seeks to extinguish our hope and supplant our faith with despair, And here is where our eyes must be kept on the prize. It must be kept on Christ Jesus. Here is where we must imbibe the word of God daily, submit ourselves to him earnestly in prayer. Christ and Christ alone must be made our dependence, no one else. The arm of flesh will fail, but God never fails. We must speak Christ, we must lift Christ, we must meditate upon him always, Fortify our minds and thereby our faith with him at all times. If you are in Christ, his testimony is that the devil cannot steal us away. The faith of Jesus will sustain you. And with his faith, we'll be able to quench the fiery fiery darts of the enemy. The enemy will come after us. But don't despair. As our faith is rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ, it will repel his attacks. The faith of Jesus reaches deep down, and those who possess it are firmly rooted and grounded in him. Those who keep the faith can be likened to the tree that is planted by the rivers of waters. They, in Psalm 1, whose roots go deep down and is nourished constantly by the Holy Spirit. When your faith is nourished, By the Holy Spirit, God sustains us. Whatever comes, we'll be evergreen. Whatever comes, despite the storms that assail us, we will be able to stand. When we turn to Revelation verse 10, we're talking about faith in these last days. Revelation 12. We are told that there is a great dragon, the old serpent in verse 9 called the devil, Satan, who deceives the whole world. And in chapter 13, we meet an apostate power that is used by Satan to force all into false worship. It is universal. 
The power exercised is universal as its power has the authority to remove all earthly support. And in verse 15 of chapter 13, it says that he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image should be killed. And verse 16, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Just ahead of us is a time of testing and trial. Just ahead of us. What happens when all earthly supports are removed? What happens when the husband cannot find work because he would not submit? What happens when the wife doesn't have work and there's no money to buy the food that we need to nourish ourselves? I wonder what the counsel of the spouses will be to each other. Will it be, honey, we got to do what we got to do to survive? Bow down and let us get on with it. Or will the counsel be, uh, let us come together in prayer. Our God is able. He will sustain us. And he is able. Just look beyond. Think of Elijah as he ran away from Jezebel. Who fed him? Who brought meat and gave him water. God did. When you look at the children of Israel in the wilderness, who fed them there? Is our God able? Has he not given us a blueprint of how he is going to sustain us? Need we fear what is coming upon this earth? Absolutely not. The Lord has a message for us to give to the world. And Revelation chapter 14 tells us that message. God says, tell them to return to him and to true worship. The Bible and the Bible alone is the only authority of faith, nothing else. This beast power later on this year will seek to improve its status through the ecumenical movement. And it gives a pretense that all is well and that they are abiding under the power of the Almighty. But the devil is a deceiver and he is a murderer and he is a liar. And the character of this power will be absolutely no different. At the cross, he was unmasked. The innocent son of God was murdered. We know what his aim is, to destroy. And the Bible warns us, and God is warning us, and he's asking us to give the warning. The devil himself and his angels will appear as angels of light, but be not deceived. God is saying, tell them, you and I must tell them that this apostate power is falling, is ruined, is defeated, is destroyed. Don't put your trust there. It will not sustain you. He's saying, tell them not to worship the beast or his image. Do not be deceived in accepting the doctrines, teachings, instructions of this fallen power. God says, tell them. Tell them I love them. My wrath is not meant for them. For this reason I came and I sacrificed myself on the cross. For this reason, I gifted them Jesus Christ. For this reason, I gifted them faith and the Holy Spirit that they may enter into my joy, not to be destroyed by my wrath. Tell them I have suffered so that they might be ransomed from sin and death. My wrath is not for them. But if they trample my sacrifice... And the blood that was spilled for their ransom and despise my salvation. If they join in rebellion and idolatry, despite my pleadings, my long suffering, then, then shall they drink of the wine of my wrath, which is poured out without mixture. For there to be justice, there must be 
judgment. You can't have love and no justice. You can't have love and no judgment. They go hand in hand. They are different sides of the coin. How can you tell those who have been trampled and who have been oppressed that they will get no recompense? That the wicked will not be punished. There must be judgment. But God is still a God of righteousness and love. For there to be justice, there must be judgment. Where the righteous, the faithless, and the persecutors and despisers of God are held accountable. If we are to stand on the sea of glass as John saw the people, we must uphold and live out the commandments, all of the commandments of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we must keep the faith, the abiding faith of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, you can do nothing without me. The vine, the branches must abide in the vine. It is only through this faith, the faith of Jesus, that will sustain us. It is only the faith of Jesus that has sustained the martyrs through the ages. I close with the words from John 14. If you turn your Bibles to me, to John 14. God has gifted us his son so that we might have life. He has given us the faith that we need to lay hold upon that life. He has given us his Holy Spirit who pleads with us, who draws us to his precious bleeding side. And the Spirit imparts to us the faith of Jesus Christ that we may hold on. But that faith must be exercised. It must be tested. It must be tested. Because if we are to stand in the presence of a holy God, we must stand having kept the commandments. And we must stand having the faith of Jesus Christ. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Tell them I am coming back for them, Jesus says. And in verse 27, Jesus' parting words, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid.